Welcome to Interface. Today we have with us an eminent scientist from the country, Professor K. P. Gopinathan, who took his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, then joined there as a faculty after several years of postdoctoral experience. He continued to be there and he served as the chairman for 10 years in the Microbiology and Cell Biology Laboratory. He was the founding scientist of the Center for Genetic Engineering at Indian Institute of Science and he continues as an INSA senior scientist associated with IASC. Welcome sir to Thank the you. program. Thank you. So, at the very outset uh, borrowing your face as the triplet code of DBT, the you know the, the, the big group which started in Delhi in 1985 which initiated uh -huh. many of the studies which have led India becoming one of the key players in the area of biotechnology. What would you say, how did you get initiated into this beautiful field of biotechnology? Okay, uh, I belong to a generation which is contemporaneous to the growth and development of this field of molecular biology, which uh, we use today as a so-called modern biology. And my association in this area dates back to the 1960s, which was some of the most exciting times in this field. Mm -hmm. You know, the times when the genetic code was discovered okay. and uh, codons were deciphered, what each one of them did. At that time, I had the fortune of associating with the leading research groups in the world. So, that kindled my interest in the area of molecular biology. So, when I came back to India and took up this faculty position at Indian Institute of Science, I decided to work on this pathogenic organism, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, that causes tuberculosis in human. Well, those days, especially in the western countries, tuberculosis was supposed to be a disease which is con contained and there was not so much interest in doing research on M tuberculosis. On the other hand, in a country like India, it was still a major public health problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem was compounded by the fact that very often the tubercle bacillus started appearing as drug resistant organisms. All right. So, at this point of time, I initiated my work, especially working on two, three drugs the isoniazid, one of the drugs discovered in the 1950s, very simple molecule which is used even today against tuberculosis, one of the most powerful drugs. Then streptomycin, an antibiotic originally discovered by Waxman, first used for tuberculosis and then subsequently rifamycin. Okay. These were the drugs which are used for tuberculosis. And my study started with deciphering how some of these drugs acted against this bacteria and how if they were acting and killing this organism, how readily this organism developed resistance against this drug. Okay. So, this with my molecular biology training, I addressed these problems and fortunately my department had a grant from the Wellcome Trust at that time and we had some resources like radioactive amino acids and so on mm -hmm. and we were one of the first groups in India to initiate molecular biology work with protein synthesis okay. as the process okay. with all my experience abroad I could initiate that. Okay. Now, so that reminds me of the FAGE group of the Cold Spring Harbor <laughs> which actually yes. initiated molecular biology yes. overseas. So, I should say this now there was a bacteriophage Mm -hmm. which will infect the tuberculosis bacteria, okay. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, mm -hmm. which was isolated from Bangalore soil. Okay. And I used this phage extensively mm -hmm. to study the mechanisms of drug resistance. Okay. In fact, going back to your story, mm -hmm. we made a very, very interesting discovery of how isoniazid acts and how it is so specific to tubercle bacillus, it does not kill many other bacteria, yeah. it only kills mycobacteria and how mycobacterium develops resistance against this drug. So, 
this was proved genetically and biochemically by my group using mm -hmm. this phage as well as the biochemical pathways. Mm -hmm. And when we sent this paper for publication in mm -hmm. the 80s, 1980s, to the journal Nature, okay. it was sent back to us saying that there is not sufficient Data. wide readership for this kind of work. Okay. And it was returned, but believe it, 10 years later in 1991, after the advent of recombinant DNA research, mm -hmm. the same work was repeated by a group from UK and Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was not only published by the same journal Nature, mm -hmm. it became the cover story as well as it became the newspaper headline, okay. Okay. how important this discovery was. was okay. I was totally frustrated by this uh, rejection okay. because I had to publish my paper then in our Indian journal Current Science okay. because it was not accepted by nature mm -hmm. and it was it went unnoticed for that reason it was in the Indian journal. journal okay. However, a few years later the editor of nature Maddox came to India. We had a discussion and I, I pointed out this fact and I showed him my data and the paper. He was very regretful about it and he went back to UK and wrote an editorial in Nature how important this work was done here yeah. before. But of course nobody reads that uh, rejoinder. Everybody read only the paper okay. and uh, I didn't get the priority for that work. Okay, okay. So at this point of time I decided to change my area of work because I felt I was scooped out what I have been doing. Okay. All right. So I thought and in the meanwhile the recombinant DNA technology and genetic engineering came into form. Fortunately, I had a chance to associate with some of the laboratories which were pioneers in this field. Mm -hmm. I went to UK and did the DNA sequencing work there okay. and this was the group which also was very actively participating in these enzymes called restriction enzymes, enzymes okay. which won the Nobel Prize yeah. uh, that time. So I had a first hand experience with that. Okay. So now we could ask questions in biology which we were not able to do earlier with the powerful techniques of genetic engineering. Okay. So once again, we were one of the first groups in India to initiate research on recombinant DNA research. And for my work, I chose an organism of importance to India, mm -hmm. of economic importance to India, that is the silkworm. Okay, so that was the reason for the shift. The shift to the okay. silkworm. Mm -hmm. Silkworm is economically very important. Mm -hmm. In India, nearly 6 million people make a livelihood okay. with sericulture, mm -hmm. cultivation mm -hmm. of silk. And the silk research and activity are mostly confined to uh, the central silk board laboratories mm -hmm. who were primarily concentrating on the extension work, okay. how to you know supply the metal races and breeds to okay. farmers and so on. Nobody has ever thought of using it as a basic system okay. for carrying out research. So in terms of a scientist who is interested in genetics or molecular biology, this organism provides a great choice. Okay. I mean, the fundamental question I asked was that although the information to produce silk is present in this organism at all times of its development, why is it making silk only at a only particular at a time. time point? Or why is silk produced only in the silk glands and not in other parts, other of, the parts of the body? So what is this specificity? What is this differential expression? Okay. So this is an excellent textbook system, type system. of model to study that. So I used the recombinant DNA technology to clone the genes, to okay. express the protein, to make the silk protein in the laboratory uh, and find out all the molecular mechanisms of how this gene expression is regulated. So I would like to chip in, you know, because uh, there were exciting times when your laboratory had uh, uh, been instrumental in publishing a paper with the glowing silkworms huh. on the cover of a <laughs> journal called uh, Biotechnics in 1994. That's and correct. that was cited as the first example of using an animal system for uh, uh, biotechnology. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, what happened is then while we were doing this basic work on silkworm, okay. Uh, this idea came to me that was the time people were trying to make recombinant proteins. proteins. Mostly it was done in bacteria. Yes. 
So, I thought at that time, this silkworm, silk is a protein. Yes, yes. So, silkworms have an enormous capacity to produce large quantities of protein. Yes. So, I thought whether we could gently pervert this organism to make proteins other than silk. Yes. Not at the expense of silk, but as a part of it. So, that's how the so human that, growth hormone uh, and so insulin all correct. Thing can So, to demonstrate whether such a thing can be done, mm. I took a gene called luciferase, okay. which is the, the glow that causes the firefly, which emits gene. the okay. light. So, I used that gene, mm. manipulated the silkworm and put it into that and showed that this silkworm can now produce luciferase. Not only that, when you give this substrate, this worm started glowing and emitting light sitting yes, in the yes. dark room. So, this was the first demonstration mm -hmm. that it is possible to express foreign genes in the silkworm. Yeah. Now, the major point was at that point of time per larvae, per insect, mm -hmm. I could get almost 10 milligram recombinant protein which in a commercial lingo means if you have 100 silkworm larvae, you can get 1 gram recombinant oh, protein. Yeah. Usually, people talk about micrograms or nanograms. Yes, yes, yes. So, this yield was very, very high. good. Then we extended after having established this feasibility, we tried on uh, medically, biomedically important compound. Okay. In this case, I took specifically the human growth hormone. Okay. Human growth hormone is the hormone made by the pituitary glands yes, behind the yes, brain yes. Mm -hmm. and that decides how grow you, how fast you grow or how tall you grow, yeah. etc. And the whole supply of human growth hormone in the world is very limited yeah, yeah. because, you know, it has to be extracted from the pituitary, pituitary glands, glands and yes, no yes. human being is going to donate his pituitary. Yeah. So, the only source was the accidental death cases. Okay. So, the smart scientist earlier had cloned and expressed human growth hormone gene using the recombinant DNA methodologies. Mm -hmm. But what they all did was, in our lingo, using the cDNA methodology, of they course. made the cDNA and did it. Mm. My point was, silkob is a complex higher organism. Mm -hmm. It should be able to handle complex eukaryotic genes. Okay. So, this gene has what we call exons and introns separated four exons and five introns. Okay. So, a bacteria cannot splice this yes, up. Yes, yes. So, the idea was if this being a higher organism, even if you give these kind of interrupted genes, the organism will be able to splice, the splice it. So, we showed that mm -hmm. not only it is transcribed, it is spliced, it is translated and the human growth hormone is produced, it is oh. secreted out. Okay. And this protein could be purified in a simple step mm -hmm. and we showed that it is active biologically. Okay, you mean to say that you know the the world was using cDNAs and you went a step ahead saying I that a piece of genomic DNA. DNA was also Correct. possible to be spliced there. Yes, okay, okay. and uh, see the there is no harm in using cDNA okay. through the bacterial approach. Here the point was say in a higher organism genes are very complex and much bigger in size. Yes. So, it is not always possible for you to get the cDNAs. Okay, so, very complex genes with multiple introns and exons. Mm. If you want to express, mm. you have to go to the genomic copy okay, rather okay. than the cDNA okay, approach. Okay, okay. So, this we did and we showed that this protein that was produced mm -hmm. was even biologically active. active. Okay, okay. So, this information was picked up by the medium and then this yeah. glowing silkworm also was the first time. I think it was shown on Doordarshan, Doordarshan the turning point, the program turning point. Yes. And it, then I think even the BBC. BBC, Star TV, yeah, Star they TV. all, okay, they know. came to my lab and took the pictures of all these right, glowing right. silkworms right. and showed that. Okay. So, that was a good biotechnology development. development. So, but what about the use of this system uh -huh. for developmental biology? Because uh, the world was like uh, learning the very alphabets <laughs> of uh, developmental <laughs> biology. That is the other aspect uh, we did uh, after uh, exploiting the silkworm. Uh, we did little more there. I will complete that. That's okay. uh, instead of using this uh, firefly luciferase gene, there is something called the green G fluorescent GFP. protein. Okay, okay. So, we used that mm -hmm. and the advantage of tagging with such a thing was, if you make a virus of that sort, 
Mm. Wherever such a virus goes, mm. it leaves a footprint of green fluorescence. Yeah. So, you do not so have to inject trans that and luciferin so and when, ATP. When you want yeah. to screen an antiviral drug, okay. when you do this, you do not have to cult culture the virus, count the colonies. Okay, okay. So, you can follow the footprint of the green fluorescence. Because it leaves and a trail behind. Okay, yes. Okay, okay. If it is effective, okay. the green fluorescence is destroyed. Okay. So, it was a nice way of monitoring okay. virus infection process, okay. how to control virus. That methodology also was developed. Okay, okay. And then we extended further and tried to clone some of these genes, mm -hmm. which are uh, potential antigens that can be used as vaccines. Okay. So, we used a veterinary virus, mm -hmm. Renderpest virus, okay. and there is another virus called, which affects a small ruminants, it is called PPRV. Okay. Those two viral antigens. Mm -hmm cloned and expressed in silkworm mm -hmm. and showed that they are very active. All right. Why I did was, this work is still not complete. Okay. My ambition and to do was that you take the case like rabies. Mm -hmm. There are vaccines against rabies. But you know, if a mad dog bites, people take injections. These are tissue culture vaccine, etc. But where does the rabies originate? Okay. It originates in the wildlife. All right the foxes bite mm -hmm. the dogs mm -hmm. and they get it or even our wild animals like tigers and others. So, you are talking about the reservoirs of, of these, these uh, viruses. viruses. Okay. So, what we thought was if we make this recombinant silkworm containing these viral antigens, okay. we can use such larvae mm -hmm. as a bait to feed these organisms. Okay. Because this is a little caterpillar okay. which can be you know uh, yeah. uh, rounded up. Is, uh, these animals, carnivorous animals so don't eat. Was uh, it a way of feeding the antigens directly? No, so, yeah, the antigen is in incorporated mm -hmm. into these larvae and you fool the system mm -hmm. by putting it as part of the feed. Okay. And if you use this as a feed, mm -hmm. even in the wildlife, okay. make it as cookies or biscuits and put Water. it there. Mm -hmm. And if they happen to eat it, mm -hmm. because it is meaty substance, animals yeah. will eat. Okay. When you eat that, they get vaccinated. Okay. All right, all right. So, it was an indirect I, way of. Uh -huh. So, we developed this uh, vaccine candidate, but unfortunately, I could not continue that field work with these things because okay, it okay. needs a lot of regulations right, right. and other things. I did not go that far. So, those viruses were prepared, but in experimental model systems, we okay. could show its effectiveness. It is effective. Okay, okay. Now, you asked me earlier about the developmental. Yes. biology system. I will mention a couple of sentences on that. Having done the basic gene expression studies in silkworm, yeah. what we found was there were no simple answer to explain the projects I thought that how is this tissue specifically expressed. Okay. So, it dawned on to me that sometime during the development of the organism, this information is embedded into the system that right. you are the posterior silk gland, you make silk. Okay. You are the other part, you make that. This you mean decision to say patterning, is patterning, patterning, patterning of the during okay. the embryonic okay. development. Yes, yes. So now, as we know, in mostly in genetics and development of biology, we heavily borrow from the fruit fly Drosophila. Yes, yes. In fact, they have found out a hierarchy of genes. The complete developmental yes, biology yes. is worked out yeah. and later now in mouse and human people yes, are yes. finding the mm -hmm. same genes are conserved. Yeah. But when you talk about a tissue like silk gland where silk is produced, mm -hmm. unfortunately Drosophila does not have a silk gland. Right, right. So, where do, where do you start? So, we had to do a lot of developmental biology work, oh, God, look God. at all the genes which are possibly implicated in various types of development okay. and at that time the complete genomic sequence of silkworm is not known. Okay. So, we had to design all kinds of primers, clone fragments of genes, right. sequence them, characterize them, identify them, okay. produce antibody, produce the proteins in the lab, no, produce okay. antibodies. And we exploited and we could establish a wonderful pathway okay. how these patterning of the silk glands are laid out. Done. But uh, is, you know, there is a process called endoreplication in silkworms. Ah, yes. Does it actually interfere with what you said, developmental biology there? Yes, it is a very unique system here yes, yes. that these tissue, silk gland, mm -hmm. 
it's fully grown when the worms are born the yes, larvae yes. is born so one millimeter in size okay. when they are in the fifth insta when they are producing all this silk they mm -hmm. have grown to a size of 25 30 cm okay so this process the number of cells remain constant mm -hmm. but the dna in these cells continue, continue to multiply to without the cells dividing yes. so you have only 1000 cells which make up the silk gland oh yes so this silk dna continues to replicate so this is one strategy adapted by these worms okay. to you know without spending the energy for dividing the cell mm. you keep on multiplying within the same cell so you have a huge cell yeah. sitting with lots of dna, DNA. about 19 rounds of replication 19 rounds of replication yeah. which translates to oh. uh, 2 to the power 19 which is about okay. 400000 times like it's a way of uh, making multiple copies multiple copies because genes. it is known that some of the genes which are expressed Mm. selectively mm -hmm. uh, there is a puffing or certain yes, parts yes. of chromosomes okay. in love but silk is a complex molecule mm -hmm. many many things are involved in making silk okay it's not just enough to amplify that okay. silk gene okay. so many other genes are amplified so, so they are all located on different chromosomes okay, okay. so instead of amplifying one region mm -hmm. this has adopted a strategy of uh, amplifying the entire set of chromosomes okay. in fact this process is known as endo replication yes and we have used this as a clever tool mm -hmm. to find out the developmental patterning oh, when right. does this endo replication set in oh, how right. does it do with the uh, commitment to make silk proteins okay so i'll chip in one more question see you have told about the codons because you have been yes. one of the pioneers in studying at the time when the genetic code was being cracked Lisabeth, i think yes. when the key players of mol bio were actually being discovered as you said so i would like to ask you if the silk gland is only producing silk is there a codon bias in those cells yes. alone yes absolutely i would say a codon bias silk is the primary protein the okay. silk fibroin is a primary protein mm. which has a very very heavy codon bias yes. because silk protein is made up of primarily two three amino acids okay. you'll say glycine alanine serine yeah. mm. so almost 50% of all the amino acids are glycine yes. therefore almost the alternate codons in the silk messenger mm. is glycine okay so the worm undergoes a peculiar situation called mm. functional adaptation all right the idea is you know the commitment of the tissue is to make that particular protein mm. so what best it can do mm. to make that protein optimally okay so for this functional adaptation mm. you want to enrich with respect to glycine so, so activator so even the amino acid pool is going to be completely biased uh, not the total pool mm. but amino acids are activated as amino acid tRNA before yes, it yes, gets yes, into protein yes. So yes the glycyl tRNA would be uh, tremendously okay. high the next abundant amino acid is alanine okay. then it is serine okay. so these three amino acid pools mm. go up very very significantly okay. so going back to why do these pool go up in molecular level if you think mm. these tRNA genes are transcribed by an enzyme called RNA polymerase all 3 right, all right so it is very important for the cell mm -hmm. to coordinate the expression of rna polymerase 3 because there is no point in making all the messenger and keeping it yes it has right. to be translated into the protein yes so how does this coordination work mm. how how do they cross talk with each other okay. so that has been one of the themes of my work okay. and we have published uh, we have discovered some of the important regulatory mm. factors okay. and how this is controlled. which kind of hijacks the system to make only protein uh, pr predominantly protein. glycine okay. uh, rich fibroid silk, proteins silk. Okay, okay, okay. that was the major contribution in that now one more thing i wanted to say is about the biotechnology yes since uh, i was at one point able to convince the department of biotechnology mm -hmm. this is an important area in mm -hmm. this country sericulture mm -hmm. how can we improve the quality and quantity quantum of research in the cell, cell board institutions okay so we dbt finally formed a mm. task force dedicated to the silk research okay and i had chaired that uh, committee for several mm. rounds Years. as okay. a task force and okay. 
at this time the major idea was how to introduce the sericulture mm -hmm. the modern things and i should also bring in here the remote northeastern parts of our country all right where there are some special type of silk, of silk. so like how tassar and uh, muga tassar and muga. muga type okay, of silk okay. how this sericulture uh, the at least the prospects of biotechnology mm. in the improvement of sericulture okay. to be extended to northeastern parts That's of the country okay. and in the bargain we also try to develop mm -hmm. different groups i supported development of virus resistant strains of the uh, uh, silk silk worms, worms. so that the farmer can be so, able to but continue. internationally where do we stand in terms of the quality of silk that we produce okay. in india internationally in the quantum of silk produced china is the number one country okay. and now they have reached uh, almost 90000 or 100000 tons per year per year india is a distant second Okay. We are between 20 25000 tons okay. metric tons is our production. Once upon a time Japan was the number 2 country okay. but then silk production is highly labor intensive. Yeah. So Japan has backed out because they cannot afford to do that because labor is very expensive. No, but what do you attribute the success of China to? Like, is it because they have very sophisticated strains or uh, genetically engineered they strains? They have uh. Uh, not genetically engineered. Uh. The strains which are grown in China, they yes. are known as the bioaltine strains. Okay. Because in China, the weather, the seasons are distinct. You have all the four seasons very distinct. So what happens is the race which is predominant there, they use the bioaltine race, mm -hmm. which comes only. twice a year okay. whereas the local races in india huh. they are known as a multi voltine races they go through every 30 days or every 40 days you get a okay. so we can take four five crops okay. but the difference is the bi voltine silkworms are much bigger okay. and the our native fellows are much smaller no, no. and if you look at each one of those cocoon mm -hmm. from a bi voltine cocoon you can get a single filament Mm -hmm. which is about longer than 1 km uninterrupted oh, fiber okay. whereas our uh, native fellows make 500 to 600 meters okay, okay so the longer the fiber the better the, better the, better the quality, quality of silk okay. so people are after getting the longer yeah, fibers yes. and they are also little tougher okay. compared to our thing so earlier once upon a time the silk industry was entirely hand loom okay, and yes. woven they is. were able to use the native Races yes, because yes. when the power loom started, they could not withstand the the force that is used okay, to it would break and break. Uh, yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. the bi voltine silk is stronger. Stronger. Okay. So we started importing a lot of bi voltine, but the climatic conditions etc. do not favor total bi voltine. Bi -voltine. So what we do now is we make hybrids between native races and bi voltine. Okay. That so works. The, the that hy works. Hybrid. system is made but okay. every time you have to cross and get the hybrids okay. and select okay. and use the hybrids All so right. predominantly yeah. they are used now the hybrid okay but we have to pay the price for it they are more susceptible to diseases All right. viral infections temperature fluctuations All right. All right. and they are more demanding in nutrition All right. Then All right. our native fellows who are simple small mm. and resistant so other than the mulberry leaf do the demand no they have total preference for uh, mulberry mulberry silkworm bombyx mori eats only mulberry leaves okay, okay. but we have the other what we call the vanya silks the okay. wild silks okay like tassa okay. muga mm -hmm. they all eat different uh, host plants okay. in fact there is a silkworm called eri silkworm eri okay eri eats uh, castor primarily okay. but it can eat uh, tapioca leaves as well as okay yes, so that i think would be a promise for Okay, can a state like Kerala so where well, lots of tapioca. You know, in that sense, one way of looking at it is correct. Mm. But when they eat tapioca leaves, they may destroy the tapioca yield. As well. Okay. So I don't know food versus fiber. What do you want to do? Because okay, there will okay. be preference for food. Food, obviously. But on the other hand, this particular silk, the iri silk, has its own value because okay. the cocoon it produces is a loose cocoon. Okay, so it's not a single long fiber. Okay. So it puts a constraint. If you want to make silk, mm -hmm. you have, you cannot reel out the silk. You have to okay. spin. Spin it. Like you spin cotton. Small okay. fibers you have to spin. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to boil the cocoon on. You don't have to kill the pupa. Okay. Whereas in the mulberry silk, you mm -hmm. or the tassar silk, 
you have to boil the cocoon so mm -hmm. you destroy the pupa all right all so right. people refer to this as ahimsa silk you okay. don't kill the pupa okay. while you reel out the silk all right all right so there are very strong people like our own some of our own ministers who are very much concerned with the animal health and welfare yes, yes. etc they are all advocating uses of uh, say uh, ahimsa silk ahimsa okay, silk okay, okay. rather than killing an oh, animal okay. to produce a product that was really nice speaking to you dr gopinathan and i'm sure that uh, the audiences would have you know <laughs> had a just uh, an experience of decades as uh, the silky route <laughs> that uh, india should uh, rather pursue thank you so much uh, for the interview thank you i, I enjoyed uh, talking to you people